telling me, what's a timber man want with being a wiki? It's looking to earn a living. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. Keeping secrets, are you? No, sir. Why just spill your beans? Why just spill your beans? weeks, two days, help me to recollect. Welcome back everybody to the Horoscope Podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Chambliss, and as always, I have my co-host with me, Russell Howell. How's it going, man? Going good, man. Uh, glad to be back on another episode. Uh, looking forward to talking all things The Lighthouse. Should be, should be an exciting episode. Leave it to Luca to pick up the most fucked up movies. Uh, <laughs> but I mean... It wouldn't be the show if Luca did not pick something that was completely off the wall. So I'm looking forward to talking about this, so it'll be fun. And speaking of, Luca, how's it going? Oh, the sea is a dangerous mistress, but I'll brave it with ye, me arsies. Ye scurvy nugs will be exploring this year picture with me, come rain or storm. All right, guys. Um, first off, Salute to everybody. We do have our alcoholic beverages with us because this movie, this movie uh, needs it. Not that it's bad, but it's kind of fucked up. All right. So, yes, we are talking about 2019's The Lighthouse for uh, a 24 month. Um, oh, can I do the synopsis for this one? Uh, yes. Let's do. Uh, let's try to do a synopsis. Uh, Russ, do you want to try to do it? I mean, it's two light. It's what two lighthouse keepers, uh, pretty much uh, go to a lighthouse and they're there for what an X amount of time, and pretty much both are like driven mad to the point of you know craziness and insanity. It's really it in a nutshell. I mean, there's really not a whole lot you could talk about with this, like without. I mean, we're obviously gonna dive into it and talk about it, but that's pretty much a, the basic gist of it, really. Yeah, we will be talking this movie, so. Just be warned. Um, oh, yeah, definitely spoilers. spoilers. Um, spoiler heavy, as always. Yep, as always. Um, but first, let's kind of start with our non-spoiler thoughts. Give sure. a little a, a little mini review, and then we'll cut into what we like, what we dislike, things like that. Uh, sure. So, Luca, since this is your movie this week, why don't you start with your non-spoiler thoughts? It's gorgeous, right? I think the first thing that needs to be said about this movie, ju- it's just beautiful it's presented in uh like 119 to 1 aspect ratio so it's almost um three four um actually it's almost four five um Mm. but um so it has that really boxy quality to it um it's filmed in black and white um cinematographer for this movie was yaren blancha um and oh my god it is beautiful some of the shots in this are mystical and gothic and just the way this landscape is filmed it's so isolated so confined um you know the the boarding house and the lighthouse and the island itself are all like prisons it's like a prison in a prison in a prison and the sound design is unbelievable it's such a loud movie Mm -hmm. Um, because you have that constant sound of like the boiler engines and the the um, the horn from the lighthouse, that big mm-hmm. sound. Um, you know, before anything else, I just I just want to get out of the way that this film is gorgeous. Uh, oh yes, I definitely agree. Um, so Russ, on to you for your non-spoiler thoughts. Your first yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah. The first thing you think, Robert. I mean, Eggers shoots the shit out of this film. This is a great. 
it's a great looking film, kind of what Lucas said, not beating a dead horse. The cinematography is gorgeous. Um, you really transported to what is it like 1890s or something like that? Early, almost early 1900s. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's late 19th century. Yeah, so you're like really transported there. So like Eggers does a really great job of like transporting you there. You feel it, and I do like the way that it's shot, like the box shot that 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 it is shot and presented to you. Um, Great acting performances. You really get to see Willem Dafoe, such an underrated actor. I think this guy is like so underrated. One mm -hmm. of the one of the actors that does not have a gold statue yet, and it's absolutely mind blowing how he, he has doesn't it. have an Oscar. No, he absolutely deserved one at least for Eternity's Gate. I would have potentially given him one for this. He was great in that. He was he was great in Florida Project. I mean, he's really been putting out some solid work, like the back half of his career, which is really Peanut Butter Falcon was really good. But you know, so. To me, it's like, you know, it's just kind of how what Lucas said. The, you know, the cinematography is gorgeous. It, it really, it, it, it almost feels like you're watching like a vintage film from the early, like early 19th century. Like, the, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get that feel when you're into it. And um, I just appreciate the way that they shoot it. It's, it's a beautiful film, really beautiful film. And, you know, like I said, it really puts you into that isolation that we really have been absolutely harping on isolation 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 what, <laughs> which, I, wonder, said, I, I wonder what might be giving us the, the drive oh I, well I don't know but um but to me it's like it, it's one of those films where you know you start to see kind of like in the <laughs> kind of like in to me it's like i don't to me it's like i feel like this is almost like a uh, psychedelic thriller film you know what sure. i mean not not so not so much like like with little aspects of horror but more to me it's like i felt like it's like a psycho psychedelic thriller i think would be like a, a really screwed up way to describe this film i mean that's just me but it, it's a fun film it reminds me a lot of movies by people like joe Ruski or carl dreyer who do these like stream of consciousness movies like yeah. i think the film gets like makes it very clear very early on that you're not actually watching an unbiased view of events. You're yeah. watching someone's perspective. And what it does so masterfully is switch back and forth between which yeah. of the guys you're seeing the movie from. Like, yeah. You know, who's your vocalizer? What is the particulars of their madness? What is the particulars of their delusions? Because they're both they're both so fucked by the end of it. Like it, it almost borrows stuff from David Lynch kind of too. It's mm. almost like like Lynch would uh, I think would be a good influence on Eggers in this film because you can kind of see some of the things where Lynch would definitely be an influence on Eggers. In sure, and it's it's pretty clear. Like you know, Eggers went from directing The Witch to directing this, and The Witch is yeah. kind of a and a, a pretty artsy movie. Yeah. Um, you know, it's got some of those art house tendencies, but The Witch has a pretty linear three act structure. Yeah, it's, you know, it's still weird and it's got some experimental aspects to it, but The Witch pretty much progresses like a movie. Yeah, this is like he got you know he got huge accolades from the witch. It was a massively successful movie. I go back and forth in my head a lot whether I like this or the witch more. Yeah, uh, I do too. It's clear that this one is like way more unrestrained. He's just like, well, fuck it. I'm gonna make the weirdest, most out there. Like I'm gonna make an experimental movie and show it to a genre audience. Like there's something very brave about that. I think. Well, the caliber of acting is way better in The Lighthouse. I think we can all agree on that unanimously. Uh, to me, it's just that like you get great performances from Pattinson. Like, it's, 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 hard, it's hard to believe that this guy was in Twilight. You know what I mean? He was in that, you know, the you know, whole the uh, young adult, you know, books and stuff like that in the, in the film and stuff like yeah. that. And really, like, this was what this guy was going to be known for. And then, boy, has he pulled out some performances, man. Good like, time, high life, this. I mean, Definitely. I can't wait to see what he does with Batman. I'm looking really forward to it, man. Oh, sure. yeah. Um, so... I'll... Yeah, and then we'll install it as always. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys, um, I think we're on to my non spoiler thoughts. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I forgot where we left off, but... Um, yeah, this movie is visually beautiful. So I, I agree with, with them, too. I love the black and white style. And how really uh, basic it looks in the, like, greatest way possible. It's not full of color. It's not full of, you know, a lot of things coming your way. But it's simple in the premise and simple in execution, which I love about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's dramatically lit, right? Like, yes. Because it doesn't have a color access to work on. Um, mm -hmm. All it has is light and shade. Um, 
and it uses light and shade so well. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously the film is partially without light. Um, like, you know, it's the lighthouse, and the brightness of that lighthouse against the darkness of the rest of the island is such a stark contrast. And some of the mm -hmm. lighting is just so incredible. It looks so real. It looks so sharp. All of the edges yeah. are so defined. Yeah. Like, you couldn't shoot this in color. I don't think it would be as good it, if, no, if, if in it color. Would, it, I, th it I think it would be shit. It would look yeah. muted. It would probably look really drab. Yeah. Uh, to me, when I was thinking of black and white films, I was almost thinking of the, the same type of lighting contrast with even Psycho. Um, sure. They use, you know, the black and white. And, and there's just enough, you know, the shadow, you know, in the distance with the house and stuff like that really plays a role in the whole entire film. And I think that, like, like I said, Eggers borrows a lot from um, filmmakers of the past, I think, to to really influence this film, and it, you really feel that the whole entire uh, sure. There's, there's a feeling, of, um, like old silent movies, like Caligari and Nosferatu and stuff. Nosferatu, like that. yep, yep. Universal monster movies to an extent, and like you said, Lynch, right? Like a Razorhead, yeah. Elephant, and stuff like that. Lynch is another filmmaker yeah. who was making black and white movies, and in, in very much in the color period. Um, yeah. Because he and Eggers understand both. And you know there are other films, uh, filmmakers that have done it. Pavel Pavlyovsky, um, Woody Allen, ugh, made Manhattan, which you know as much of a shitbag as Allen mm -hmm. is, makes that film look gorgeous um, because he's working with light and shade, and he knows how to use it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so now that we got our non-spoiler thoughts out of the way, let's go into our pros, which now means spoiler warning, everybody. If you have not watched The Lighthouse, go watch it. It's yeah, fantastic. Really like, it. like, definitely go watch it. Uh, it's super good. I think it's like right over 90 minutes, so it's not even a long movie. It's about an hour and 40. Hour and 45. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, definitely uh, go check it out and then come back and uh, join the sport talk with us. All right. So, uh, Luca, since this is your movie, uh, you can start with. One of your pros. I think if we do one each, we can each bring do you up mind, do you, do you first, Hunter, I just got a message and I need to respond to it quickly. Huh? Do you, want to, do you guys mind going first? I just got a message and I need to respond to it quickly. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I can. Uh, Russ, Russ, you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, I, again, I guess I think we're just beating a dead horse with it, though. I do think the, uh, the acting performances will really drive this film. I do like yes. how we slowly start to see Pattison's character really just start to unhinge, uh, kind of like almost like uh, you know uh, Jack Torrance in The Shining. You Shining. really start to see th this captivity, this alcohol to try to kind of you know medicate yourself in, in the midst of this madness, um, and then you slowly start to see the character unravel and you know just really just lose all you know pretty much just lose all touch with reality. Just it's really like to a point where he just completely snaps. Um, yeah. And it's you can slowly start to see it happening, even with like the bickering between him and Willem Dafoe's character in it, which I think it does add a little bit of comedic uh, relief to the film sometimes. Um, but overall, I, I would say, I guess, I mean, that's really not a spoiler uh, talk, but I think to me, I think it just needs to be said that these two acting performances are really fantastic, and the fact that they weren't really recognized at the Oscars was really kind of head scratching. Uh, this, this film got this film got such good buzz when it came out, and it got you know critically loved. You know, uh, and, and and so did the audiences loved it too. And I don't understand where we got lost there to try to like really, you know, nominate this film. Especially, yeah. The, the thing that drives me nuts is when the Oscars have ten films <laughs> and they only put nine in. It's like you can have so many other spots. Yes. You, have, you, know, you can utilize and, and like who cares if they're not going to win? But you like recognize these like you know these pieces of art because that's what mm -hmm. they are. It's kind of crazy that the the Academy. Who it's it's supposed to gear towards you know artists and stuff like that don't really do that it's kind of it's really head scratching yeah that's gonna be an an episode all to itself horror and the Oscars for sure I think that one of the things that like staggers me about because like so this was actually nominated for best cinematography at the Academy Awards mm -hmm. um, yeah and it didn't win and curiously Roger Deakins won for 1917 now Roger Deakins is a guy who wasn't Given the given the duty deserved by the Oscars for ages, and then he and won then finally, two yeah. Years in a row. And it's Blade like Runner. you're making up for lost time here, clearly, because 1917 is gorgeous and it's going to be seen by more of the Academy posters. But this looks better. It yeah, looks better. Um, yeah, 
you know, it's more interesting. It's more, it's pushing more boundaries. Um, and it's just this lack of respect for genre filmmaking that is always there at the Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I agree. Um, Deacon, Deacon shot the hell out of 1917. I mean, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. But granted, this is like, this is different. This goes like, this is way different. Like just the cut, like the whole black and white aspect of this and, and just the, it's just how beautiful the lighting, just everything about it. It's just, it's, just, yes. it's beautiful to watch in like a completely dark, dark room. And mm-hmm. it, it's just, it's so ominous and beautiful. Like you have to, you just have to love that, you know? Oh yeah. I can, I can go on about the best cinematography Oscar because like <gasps> four of the five films nominated for best cinematography that year were nominated for best picture. And it's literally just all of the films that are nominated for, for best picture that get the best cinematography nominations. But they recycle the same exact thing that Luca threw out the whole entire category. Exactly, like, you know right? what I mean? And, and that's the thing that sucks. It's like, okay, well we know the Joker's going to get nominations. We know, you know what I mean? You, you mm-hmm. see it, you know what I mean? Like little women was a little miss, you know, represented, but anyway, but other films I'm saying that, you know, are nominated for best picture. Like, you know, Uncut Gems wasn't even nominated. Adam Sandler wasn't even nominated. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you have so, you, you, so it. you have he so much. He totally that I, deserved it. That I feel that the Academy completely drops, and I don't know if it's because of the age demographic of the of the uh, the voters. It, to me, it's like I, I don't know. I think we really just need to clean up the whole entire Academy. We just really need to st- you know start fresh because it's there's it's a shame that these films go completely unrecognized. You know what I mean? And you know. Mm-hmm. It's the main. It's it's these mainstream films that are the ones that actually you know get the you know nominations, get the acting nominations, and yeah, everything like that. But I mean, then you, then you have films like Marriage Story, where you know you have two solid performances, and and it's a Netflix original. You know what I mean? So like, you know, I don't, I don't know. We're we're getting there. I I think it'll be <laughs> it'll be it'll be within the near future. I think we get some love for the horror genre, though, man, because it, it, it's it's a damn shame that we have. Yeah. It. It'd be super interesting to do like a to do a like top ten Oscar top ten horror movies that should have been nominated for Best Picture. For sure, oh, absolutely. that'd be a great list. Yeah, there's. I mean, I, there's a ton. I might have to do that one day. There's Ooh. a ton. There's a ton. There's a ton of them. Um, but as I said, this is definitely going to be a topic we can talk about in its entirety on a full episode one day. Um you know, horror at the Oscars, because we can get into so much detail about it. Um, but Russ did bring up the uh, the great acting in this movie, so let's go off that topic, and then we'll kind of rotate our pros. That way we can talk about one topic for a little bit longer. I just think that this movie is... So I saw uh, Good Time and High Life, and I saw Attorney Escape, Peanut Butter Falcon, and... Um, uh, Florida Project, um, all in, you know, when they came out, and I've, I've rewatched them all since. These are two of the best actors working in Hollywood. They are just two of the best actors working right now. Um, you That's know, and they're easy to say for Robert Pattinson, especially where he started from. For sure, Cedric Diggory and Edward Cullen, and you know, I I, I think that that I I am actually so incredibly happy to see what the Twilight stars have done. With, like, Me the main- too. Oh, Both yeah. uh, Kristen Stewart and Aurora Madison are down really incredible performances in other movies. Um, Kristen Stewart's but yeah. Th- this film is all about Defoe for it me. It is. Uh, Pattinson's great, incredible. He's the main character of the film. But Jesus Christ, some of Defoe's moments, his big speech to Pattinson when um, when he's he's like, you like me, lobster. And Pattinson's like, I don't find it. Like, it's, 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 you're terrible. And he just yeah. bursts out with this whole, like, may Neptune drag ye down into yeah. the deep and ye shall be only the sea. You know, all of that. Like, he's so salty. And you get so much of a varied character out of him. He's grumpy. He's curmudgeonly. He's funny. Yeah. He's tender. He's fatherly. He's vulnerable at times. Um, he's got, yeah. like, this incredible vulnerability and accessibility to I'm not saying that Pattinson's bad either. Pattinson's got some great moments and it's clear that this is a man really weighed down by his past and also his sanity is is so incredibly fragile. But it's 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 Defoe through and through for me on this one. Oh absolutely. I mean and the other thing with Defoe and like kind of that scene that you're saying, it's like Defoe is just looking for a reason to be liked or be accepted by Pattinson's character in this film. Um, it, like how he's like, oh you like this or you like that. He just wants him to like at least have some kind of common ground because I feel like they're like oil and water throughout this whole entire film. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the, the, like 
we're going to say again and again, though, these are like, and Defoe really does drive this performance, though, for sure, as like the completely like lunatic, you know, unhinged person that he is in this film. Pattinson's great, too. I, I would give the edge to Willem Defoe just because of the fact that it's really testing their capabilities as actors, I think. But um, to me, he's like I said, were, he's, he's very theatrical in this. I think, you know, yeah. the thing that tips Defoe over the edge is that he is, he allows himself to be operatic and Wagnerian and really, really, really big. Whereas Pattinson always feels like he has this tiny bit of restraint, um, which I think that lets Defoe shine a little bit more. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll i agree with that. Yeah. Um, see, I actually. It's gonna sound weird. Um, I love Defoe in this movie, but I freaking adore Robert Pattinson in this movie, man. The way his character starts from like wanting to get along, but still like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. And by the end, he's screaming and yelling, calling Defoe like selfish for not showing him what's in the light. Um, you know, bringing up, what is it? One of my favorite quotes. Um, he's talking about like, you're not my damn father. Uh, you're not my, oh, you're not, you're not, you're not a father. You're not a captain. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you never you were. were. You never were. You ain't my dad. Yeah. He's pretty yeah. much under, undermining his character. Like he's really belittling kind of like the scene in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles where Steve Martin kind of just lashes out at John Candy's character. Sure, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. Really, really, really bring him down like, and like, hum like humiliate the character pretty much. You heard um, it first, guys. Uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles in the Lighthouse, same movie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, guys. That's right. Could you imagine John Candy and Steve Martin? Was, oh, oh, my God. God. <laughs> Jeez. But, like, but like we see, and it's almost, but it is like that kind of because of the fact that they're, like, they're both, like, itching at each other about little shit that they do. So, I mean, it does, you know what I mean, Luca? You are mm -hmm. you are right, though, in, 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 a, in a, you know, in a sense. Um, to me, it's even like, you know, he's even picking out, like, you know, Willem Dafoe farts and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> like he's... Like when you when you know like that's when you know I think that you're damn thoughts. When, God yeah, damn thoughts. like you, like to me it's one of those things where it's like you know when you're pushing you're literally like throwing that out and saying you know your farts even bother me. That's I mean you're like really trying to pick pick something to really hate the other person for. But like yeah, I said, it, but the, the films you know it drives from the two characters. I mean mm -hmm. you, you can't have one without the other, and I think they both bring out the best in each other in this film. Oh, yeah, and definitely, I'm not saying anything bad about Defoe. I love his performance, but I feel like Defoe starts off kind of at this high pitch and keeps it going. I think Pattinson kind of progresses and slowly goes nuts over time, and I feel like he does that super, super well in this movie. That's true. There is more of a transition in Pattinson's character. I think it's interesting, like, what we're talking about, like, how much they hate each other and, you know, how they're looking for things to get annoyed with each other about. I think it's also very interesting that, like, these characters also like love each other and love each other in multiple different ways. Yeah. They love each other as father and son, as a proud boss and employee, as dare I say, lovers. Uh oh. Um, well, you know, yeah, because I mean, there's one scene where that, that restraint that that, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that moment yeah. where you think they're gonna kiss, kiss and, then, and they don't. He pushes them back. But we've seen that we've seen that same type of thing though, that macho machismo type thing where. Like it's, they don't want to give in with what they want though, because like even in Brokeback Mountain, same type of thing where Heath Ledger pushes J you know Jake Gyllenhaal's character away from him. So like to me, it's like I kind of what Luca like hitting the you know uh, hammer the nail on the head there, just because like I, I think there is a little bit more going on than meets the eye there. I think there That's is like, all, all the of... no, and, and, and all different sorts of relationships, underlying mm -hmm. relationships with these two characters. I think there is. Like how you said, the proud boss, you know, the proud employee, the like trying to please the boss, trying to get that out of boy, um, because there's because like look at all the uh, work that Willem Dafoe like you know really much packs on Robert Pattinson's character, you know what I mean? Kind of overtasks him, but like mm -hmm. you know Pattinson doesn't, you know what I mean? It's it's downpouring and he has that wheelbarrow and he's like you know there's a, a coal for the fire and he's sitting there like he's getting drenched. And he's just trying to do his job, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he he wants that reassurance. He wants that add a boy type thing, and he wants to please Willem Dafoe's character, who's obviously been way more around the block at the lighthouse. You know what I mean? Being a lighthouse keeper than yeah. Dafoe, because Dafoe really, or uh, than uh, Pattinson. Pattinson, Pattinson kind of just 
like really just fell into this like career. And he says that in the film. But he's also um, the interesting thing is like you were talking about this machismo thing. Yeah. Willem Dafoe is also making up lies to big himself up because he was never a oh, yeah. captain. Yeah. You know, he, tells, he makes up contract, uh, conflicting stories about what happened to his leg. You know, there's this whole yeah. idea of like, they're both trying to be bigger than they are. They're both trying to yeah. impress the other one. And it uses, you know, those different kinds of relationship, father, son, quasi romantic sexual stuff, yeah. um, bickering, bickering married couple. When, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, for sure. Willem Dafoe's like, please tell me you like my food. And, and Pat's is like, food shit. <laughs> Food's terrible. Go back to the kitchen. Go back to the kitchen. Make me something else. It's like a pissing contest between these two through the whole film, though. It is really. Um, I actually love the as you guys brought up the different elements that they bring with each other, especially where they're like the only time these two can actually get together without fighting is when they're drunk. That's yeah. a, that's the thing. But I think Defoe says something about that though, mm. uh, about like, li like you know, uh, wikis or, or lighthouse keepers or something like that, where you, that's the only thing that really keeps, uh, you know, you sane or whatever, or keeps is you the like, alcohol. Ground, grounded is the alcohol. And yep. we see a ton, and, but it's even like, and again, I'll even compare it to um, the master where uh, Joaquin sure. Phoenix's character is mixing like all sorts of different shit and chemicals, like turpentine and stuff like that, yeah, just to get drunk. Just, just to get drunk. I mean, just to get drunk, just to get that buzz, man. It's and they crazy. actually do something like that in this movie, right? Yeah, they make that's, turpentine. That's, um, turpentine. Defo Defoe's emergency rations are all booze. Like the yeah. things that he wants to bury in the yeah. in a if a storm happens in the provision, it's all just booze. Yeah. Um, and there's this kind of there's this parallel, right, between them and the lighthouse, right? For the lighthouse to keep going, it needs to be fed with oil. For yes. the wikis to keep going, they need to be fed, with, fed alcohol. with alcohol. Like, yeah. there's, a, there's this parallel of, like, you don't function in such an isolated place. You don't function in such stressful circumstances if you're not fucked. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you have to be in that situation because there's no <clears throat> social interaction. I mean... Outside of the two characters, there's none of that social interaction outside of that. It's it's desolate, and mm -hmm. you know it, it is. It's it kind of again. It, but look at look at Jack Torrance again turning to the alcohol. Shining, yeah, you know what I mean. So I mean I'll use that as a parallel too because you see some of these characters in horror movies driven to alcohol to kind of yeah, cope I, with that whole you know wrestling yeah. around with those types of emotions and stuff. I think this film was heavily influenced by The Shining. I definitely think there's a lot of Shining. It's absolutely that. absolutely is. One of the things that all, you know, all horror movies made up to the 1980s year <laughs> are influenced heavily by the Shining. Uh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. One of the things I like about this movie so much is like, it's actually like it gets completely crazy by the end of it, and it's pretty crazy for for like this, like the third act as a whole. I like how much restraint this movie shows, actually. Yeah. Um, so that you know, when you first, when um, Pattinson first goes up to the top of the lighthouse and he sees Defoe and he sees the tentacle of the octopus. You're yeah. like, okay, there's going to be an octopus monster in this movie. We're now going to see nothing but octopus monster for the rest of this movie because yeah. the octopus monster is in the trailer too. Um, yeah, you don't see it. You don't see it until the very end. Very of the very movie. end. Come yeah. Again until the end of the movie. You, Robert Pattinson finds the mermaid on the on the rocks, and yeah. he, you know, kind of has some kind of sexual thing with a mermaid. You don't see the mermaid again until the end of the movie, mm -hmm. and you don't actually see them necessarily. There are these. It's just you, visions hallucinations is visions like it yeah it gives you these hints up front and then pulls way back and just focuses on the film is ultimately like a two-person interpersonal drama mm -hmm. um, like plants these seeds along the trail and yeah. it just lets them rest and lets them sprout and brings them back when they're most effective but i think the utilization of like the mermaid i get because of the fact that like you know you're, a, a, you know, a straight male, we think, in this film. You know what I mean? You have that urge to, you know, be with a woman. And I think, you know, Pattinson, even in that scene where near the back end of the film when he's he's trying to make out with the uh, the mermaid or whatever, and it's it's literally him trying to kill uh, Defoe's character. Defoe. You know, at the end of the film, you know what I mean? He um, masturbates to the um, masturbates statuette. To the, to the statuette, yeah, that was left there. So clearly i think it's been done before before exactly the right like it's yeah. very in yeah. the bed yeah cuz it's in the it's in the mattress so clearly somebody yeah. did the same exact type of thing with it so i mean that's that's the thing that i got from it but but we all know that Pattison's character is going to kill Defoe's <clears throat> character we know it 
like for the minute you're watching it, you're like, he's completely unhinged by Defoe's character. What the hell's going to happen? For sure. and, and, and it's slowly like, you know, the ball of yarn starts to unravel as you go through and through the film. But um, yeah, yeah. You know. I think it makes it pretty clear at the beginning. It's like, neither of these guys are going to get off this island ever. Yeah. You know? And, and the way that I kind of saw the ending, which we're jumping, but hey, you know, is when Pattinson killed Defoe's character in this movie, he now takes over the role of Defoe's character. He becomes the crazy lighthouse owner who now is going to pass it on to another young person. And then the, it's just kind well, of a continuing he, he, cycle. He's having his guts chewed out. Right, like yeah, I mean, he's having oh. his, his his organs eaten by a bird. Um, he That's right. Gets, he gets he gets consigned to this Promethean fate, right? Like this is Prometheus, right? So Prometheus is a character in Greek mythology. He brought fire to people, and as punishment for giving fire to humans, Zeus uh, condemned Prometheus to be chained to a cliff and have a vulture eat his liver, and his liver would regrow every day, and a vulture would eat his liver every day. Yeah, it's like. There's an there's a an, an apocalyptic weight to his actions that he will be punished for forever. It also speaks to things like there's a poem called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, where the ancient mariner kills an albatross and as such has to go through like a, a sailing journey through death and life, there's an ice storm and all that kind of stuff. Like it's it it's evoking this mythology and folklore stuff, um, whether it's sirens or krakens or or the ancient mariner, like all of this stuff. It's all it's all in this very mythological context but yeah. I, I, but i think the drawing point to where this <clears throat> where we kind of f find out like or we kind of can suspect pattison's doom is for the bird when he when he completely he, he kills the, the bird because i think to me it's kind of disrespecting all the sailors from before mm -hmm. everybody from mm -hmm. that has come before him because I, we find out you know uh it holds Defoe's, the souls of Defoe's characters talking about how the souls are of the the sailors that are you mm -hmm. know, have gone before him or whatever have kind of you know taken the form of a of a what is it a, a not a not a, a geese it's, but a bucket it's, it's, it's an albatross an albatross yeah yeah so we, we get that so I think him doing that is one of those things kind of, kind of like almost like a spit on them or disrespect to them and I think that this is mm -hmm. where. His characters, you know, obviously, you know, the pretty much the writing's on the wall here. He's not going to make it through the film because of this disrespect, I think, for you know everybody before him. Yeah, so, I think yeah. it's interesting though, that there's a there's an albatross in the cistern before he does it, right? Like he sees the yeah. corpse of the albatross. I think what that is implying is that Defoe has done this too, mm -hmm. right? He's or also some, or another wiki before him, maybe, for sure. Or, you know, like, yeah. Either his either Defoe's previous wiki. Or Defoe himself has done this, so like yeah. there, there's some some element of like this is a cycle, right? Yeah. yeah. He finds the other wiki's head in the box at sea, in the lobster yeah. trapping box. Um, so like there's this idea of it being cyclical and never ending, and you know, it's it's fate, right? It's fatalistic, and you do know very early that these guys are just like, they're so fucked, they're so they're so doomed, so incredibly doomed, partially yeah. because Robert Robin Eggers movie and these films don't have unilaterally happy endings. I guess Anya Taylor Joy kind of has a happy ending in, in but, Witch. But does um, she really? <laughs> it's right. It's one of the things like, uh, does she? <laughs> yeah. Um so kind of we've talked about all my pros in this movie pretty much, just like talking about the movie, uh, the dialogue, um, making you feel what the characters are feeling. Um let's kind of go into some of our favorite quotes. Sure. Which there's a lot of them. Um, I'll start with this one if you guys don't mind. Sure. Um, I like the one where um, what's the foe's character's name? I, I it's Tom, Thomas. Tom, Tom, they're, Tom they're, Thomas. They're they're both Thomas. Yeah. Well, well we find out they're both. Yeah. Thomas, yeah. So. Says his name is Ephraim Winslow, but his name is Tom. His Tom. Uh, yeah. Tom Howard. Howard. Howard yeah. yeah. Howard. Um, um but. Um, so Tom is talking to uh, Winslow at the time. He goes, are you a praying man, Winslow? And he comes back with, not as often as I might, but I'm God-fearing, if that's what you're asking. Sure. Yeah. Um, God-fearing is a way at the time to just say, I believe in God. But I think when, when a modern audience hears that, because obviously in the same way that the, the, um, the New Testament changed the Old Testament, 
Um, Christians more recently focus more on loving the loving God, the Jesus Christ, the die for our sins, all that kind of stuff. But up until very recently, the idea of believing in God was fearing God, right? Mm-hmm. Especially in the Middle Ages, but it carries on, right? Um, so this idea of God fearing, um, I think what's interesting is we kind of it, it kind of implies the movie implies that Winslow um, slash Howard is not superstitious. He's not. He's he's kind of a materialist kind of guy. Yeah, um, he'll, he'll kill the girl because it's annoying. Him. Because it's frustrating him because he can't do his job because it seems to be annoying him. Yeah. Um, so I I, I I really like that quote um, because I think it's a lie actually. I do um, too. I think it is just, it's just false. Um, I think that he's a materialist guy and he directly contrasts with Wake's superstition. Um, well, to me, like what I got out of it when he was said he was a God fearing man, he may not be overly like religious. But to me, I think he believes in the fact that there is something after, after life, death, so, so, sure. so to speak. There is somebody judging you. And I think at the end, like, you know what I mean? I, to me, I don't mm-hmm. think it's like overthrowing saying, hey, you need to believe this and like, you know, be a Bible thumper or anything like that. I think oh, no. he, I think he does think, though, that there is a uh, higher power that is, you know, in charge of all this. And I think like, you know, deep down inside, he does fear that because everybody does. They fear the unknown. They What, what happens after life, you know? Uh, it, sure. it is one of those things. So to me, I, I do think that he does believe it, but he's not overly like, you know, you're, you know what I mean? Like, let's pray. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's read the Bible. Let's do all this every, you know what I mean? So I think yeah. he's loosely, I think he's loosely a little bit, you know, yeah, it's, it's, not, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not thrown in your face. That's no, nice. no, no, no. And I think to me, I think he does, I, I, I use it in quotes, like religious, just because of that. You know what I mean? I, I think he does show signs of being religious but not overtly mm-hmm. you know what i mean definitely my, my favorite scene in this movie by far is is one of the speech harp tried and hark bellow bit our father the sea king rise from death's full foul in his fury it's so poetic <laughs> and theatrical and it's like he's reciting a spell mm-hmm. or praying to some evil god like there's something there's something lovecraftian about a lot of this movie um and this idea of like conjuring an evil god from the depths because someone didn't like your cooking, cooking. <laughs> is equally hilarious. But Defoe is so intense, so intense. Um, but yeah. it's, it's it's almost like Sam Jackson and Pulp Fiction when he's giving that speech. You know, you're I mean? a real singer. Uh, exactly. Just the same type, exactly. the same type of thing. Very right? that, um, just just that whole type of you know come down you know with great fury. You know, just that type of thing. It's almost like he's like, not even like, it's almost like summoning a curse or something like that to him, you know? But crucially, but like, crucially, what it has indifference to, um, uh, to Sam Jackson's, uh, uh Ezekiel, uh, 125. I don't fucking know. Yeah, 125. It's Ezekiel um, something. I know that. His, his Ezekiel passage, which is made up, by the way, not a Bible passage. Um, this speech is much longer, way longer. Um, and he's, it's, oh, he, yeah. goes, he goes on and on and on and on. And I just think it's so funny when at the end of it, Pattinson is like, all right, I like your cooking. <laughs> I like your cooking. <laughs> sure, I like it's fine. Yeah, and I, think it's yeah I, like, I just want this to be over with already, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah no. it's literally <laughs> like, a, like a married couple. When they fight, the, the exactly. husband's just like, I'm done, all right? Like, yeah, yeah. yes, you win. I love I love um, Defoe's <laughs> delivery on... Uh, <laughs> I just spill your beans. beans. It's so like. Oh over- yeah, that's. Hi, uh, Russ. I, I oh. think as well has another great quote when we were talking about this whole like not able, to, not able to touch a woman, not able to like you know have human contact. <laughs> when Pattinson is like, if I had a steak, a steak. I'd, fuck. <laughs> I'd fuck that steak. <laughs> <laughs> it's so obvious. Oh man. All right, Russ, on to you for uh, one of your favorite quotes. Kind of what you – I mean, I think we, we, we really touched all of them. I mean, we really did. Like, the, why would you spill your beans? Like, him basically <laughs> saying that his name's Thomas. He's lied about his name or whatever, blah, 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 because he took the name of his uh, – what was it his former boss or something it's like that? former boss who he killed. Yeah. Former yeah. surveyor yeah. or something like that. Something like that, and that, that's, like, the big thing. But he really, like, beats the fucking drum with this – why'd you spill your beans type thing? You know, why'd you, you know, tell me who you really are type thing, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's such a, you know, obviously when you think of this film, you think of that, 
Um, the farting obviously is another thing that you obviously go back to. You goddamn uh, fart. And, uh, and I mean, those are probably I, I would say the two. And then obviously the scene I think obviously with the uh, the albatross where he just completely goes unhinged. Obliterating it. And you got to watch this thing. They have the um, they have him doing that set to the theme of <clears throat> Seinfeld. So every time he hits it, you hear the fucking beginning of the Seinfeld. But there's the only. <laughs> You, you have to watch. It's absolutely hilarious. Oh, totally recommend it. You need to pull that up and watch it. It's hilarious. I promise. This is, this is, but, I, I would say this movie is pretty memeable. Like, oh, some of them, uh, yeah. You know, like, this could be memes. Because it's, so, it's so loosely, you know, you could put anything into it, I think, is the thing. You know what I mean? It's so loosely, you could just put, cut and paste whatever you want into it, and I think it would fit perfectly, you know? Um, the other scene that I really like is the ending of the scene. Where you see his eyes glowing up at the the, the lighthouse, I love that fucking scene. That's where a you hear great it, scene. Yeah, whoa, whoa, like like, whoa. and then you just see his eyes glowing, and you hear his like, it's like just, it's almost like when Frank the Tank gets hit in the, with the neck with the dart. He's like, wait, what up? You know what I mean? Like you hear that. Yeah, like, it goes, voice, it goes very his voice um, is just static like, static it, it, and, yeah. Ah, type stuff. And I, I I love that scene though. I really do because I think. It's like at that scene, I feel like he's like finally he finally got to do what he wanted to do. He's finally up there at the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he he's like completely like omnipotent now. He's like completely like has all this power. And what happens? He fucking falls down the stairs. You know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's completely yeah. crazy. Yeah, like that's that's the, I think that's the most poignant message in the entire movie, right? Like yeah, he completely put Defoe into submission. Yeah, he. Really, he literally called him a dog. I he, had him on the made, made him a dog. He de- he dominated him. He buried him alive. He hit him with an axe, and he goes up and he gets enlightenment and he's accepted by the lighthouse. And then what does he do? He falls down the stairs like a fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> it's that idea yeah. of like ultimate enlightenment is going to make you less of a dickhead, fucker. Pretty <laughs> much. So when he fell down the stairs, did he kind of like crawl or gimp or whatever to being on the island? When he, I think, the ending, I think that the ending is kind of fairly symbolic. Um, yeah, I don't know how literal it's supposed to be, but presumably it's been a while. Like he's just kind of gone out there and been not being able to keep moving and had his like clothes ripped off from him by the gulls okay. bit by bit, and then his like it's up to the viewer to interpret how real they want that to be. I actually see, see that ending as almost. His version of hell. It for, is. For, it is very much for, like for him killing the seagull. Now he had. Is it the seagull? Uh, it's it's same. I mean, there's. I think it's, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's big. It's a big. It's a, bird. It, it's a bird. I mean, it's, it's yeah, same. yeah. Pitch, the bird. Yeah, yeah kind of like. Uh, I'm not sure which story it was, but having to push the boulder up only for it to come down, and having to push it back up. Yeah. Sisyphus escaped death. He literally he, he imprisoned death and escaped from death. Um, and uh, Hades let death out, and um, they decided the death was too good for him, and he was fated to roll a boulder up the hill and have it roll down the backside every single day. Um, which is very similar to Prometheus, right? You get your liver eaten out by a bird, your liver grows back, and then you get your liver eaten out by a fucking bird again because you're an yeah. idiot because you broke the rules. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, broke and that's what. Rules. And that's what I'm seeing. Like he's already dead, but this is just his version of hell. He's literally just being eaten by the birds constantly. For sure, it's not even just that he's already dead. This is his version of hell. He's not allowed to die, mm-hmm. right? Like he's still there. He's still got to go through this. Like he's moving, I think. Um, and he's oh, posed okay. in that, like creation of uh, what is it? Creation of Michael? Creation of Adam? Creation of Adam? Kind of way. Like there's a very kind of laid back biblical thing to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a mix of like sailor folk tales, Greek mythology, and Judeo Christian stuff. Um, um to me to me though that's what I, that's what I got though out of it. Like I got okay he falls and I think he obviously he can't walk. I think he's obviously broken his legs or something. Where mm-hmm. he crawls and then he's like laying out like on the on the shore side or whatever. And I think that's where I, I think he just can't move, and I think that's where he's like pretty much, kind of like you know his final resting spot. I think, and that's what. Well, and and I think again, I think it comes again from the disrespect of you know him going crazy and just like you know uh, beating the shit and killing the uh, albatross there when he has that scene that meltdown. 
And I think it's like almost like kind of you reap what you sow type thing. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, and I think that, that that whole thing. And then the other thing is I, I, I think about, because you were talking about Greek mythology, I o- almost even <laughs> think of Icarus too with flying too close, close, to flying close, to close to the sun. Uh, kind of like over pushing your boundaries, like pushing it to mm-hmm. the limit, I think, and, and failing. It's, it's like almost like that type of thing. You know what I mean? There's, there are a lot of people yeah. thought, like if you consider the lighthouse to be like a godly deific figure, um, yeah. there are a lot of great stories where people see gods and are just vaporized like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The the mortal Semele um, has a child with Zeus in disguise and says to Zeus, you need to show me your true form. And Zeus does, and she's just obliterated. You come that close to God, you're, you're gone. Yeah. Um, so I have one more uh, quote, but we kind of picked it apart already. It's the Robert Pattinson scene. Your goddamn thoughts. You got them. Uh, what is it? You smell like piss. You smell like jism. You smell like curdled foreskin. Which I have a, a curdled foreskin. He like says all this shit. Yeah. That's disgusting. Um, My, like, because I'm trying to like pick it apart here. Um, so it's just this line right here. You think you're so goddamn mi- high and mighty just because you're a goddamn lighthouse keeper? Well, you ain't a captain in no ship. You never was. You ain't no general. You ain't no copper. You ain't the president. And you ain't my father. Yeah, there's a there's a refusal of authority there, and Paxton does so much to try and please Defoe, um, but like their relationship is so toxic, it so is, and so codependent, and like they're <laughs> intermittently looking for approval for the other and trying to kill, trying trying to kill each other. Yeah, and there are times when when uh, Pattinson really does treat Defoe like a father, um, mm-hmm. but it's just this symbiotic relationship of, of torture and and pain. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if if you guys don't have any more favorite quotes or moments, um, not every movie doesn't have uh, no cons. Um, Not every movie doesn't have no cons. What? Be quiet. Uh, Every every movie has cons. Every movie has cons. Except for the Wicker Man. Um, Except for the Wicker Man. (laughs) I mean, misery. Misery had James Con. Uh, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> there you go, uh, Russ. Ha, 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 ha. Gotcha. Oh, um, yeah. All right, Russ. Um, so let's go into some of the cons that you have in this movie. Uh, to me, it's sometimes you're just wondering what the fuck's going on. I think that. I think, but to yeah. me, I, I feel like a lot of those films. Again, we've said it already with The Shining too. I think it's one of those things where, you're like, you go back and watch it and get different things out of it each time you do. Um, and I've said that again about Kubrick's films, always like that. I think you can watch Kubrick's films, not understand what the hell's going on, watch it again, get a little bit out of something, you know, get something mm-hmm. out of it a little bit. Same thing. Same thing with David Lynch. Said the same thing before, you know, obviously Luke and I were talking about that. Same type of thing. You can watch it and then watch it again and get something different out of it. I think this is, Eggers is the same way in this type of film because, you know, uh, on rewatching it, I think you get more and more from it, like the more you watch it. Um, it's, it is. It's one of those Lynch, like Lynchian type films. It's. It's. It, it, there's. You can interpret it any way you want. There's no. This is the cut dry. You know what I mean. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, boy meets girl. Bo- you know, boy falls in love with girl. They live happily ever after. Done. You know what I mean. Like the, these films here require a little bit more thought, and it, it, it's kind of up to you to fill in the pieces. I think. So to me, it's mm-hmm. like I feel like Eggers kind of wants you to kind of interpret it how you want to interpret it. There's no right or wrong way. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that's a con. I mean, I really wouldn't call it a con. I mean, it, it does require a little bit more thinking from the audience. Um, but overall, I, there's really not a whole lot of bad about it. I would say I think just the inconciseness of the, of the story, of the, of, the, of the, you know what I mean, of the, the plot – because you sometimes are wondering, because you you're there too, like you're almost a, driven to a point of madness yourself. Watching, yeah. and you're like you're like, what the hell am I trying? What am I doing here? Like, why are we? You know what I mean? And I think again, that's try to be symbolic of what you're watching. So to, so so to mm-hmm. me, uh, I think that that's kind of you know plays hand in hand. I got you. Uh, play hand in hand of what's uh, you know what's going on in the film. I don't know if that's really a con though. Yeah, um, I'm gonna because I only have one. I think the movie is a bit too long. I agree. Uh, yeah. just, just a bit. Maybe, not, maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes and it would have been perfect. Yeah, you could, you but, could shave that down to 90 minutes easy. But that's that's really the only, that and I got confused on, as, as I said in the chat, I wasn't sure what the hell was going on at points, but I, yeah. I think that's kind of the point of the entire movie. 
It is. is that I, I mean, at least I do. You're not supposed to like piece everything together on the first or second view. It's a um, loose interpretation, I think. Because I remember yeah. I watched Mulholland Drive like two or three times. I mean, it's well, one of those movies you, you, you oh, gotta watch. Baby. You gotta watch, and you're like, you get different things out of it every time you watch it. Again, it's like it's it's just just like Kubrick's films. I think it's it's one of those types of films. You're gonna get something from it every time you watch it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Luca. I'm sorry, I have to do this, but I'm surprised I don't have that many films for this movie. <laughs> um, I actually no, I I do. One is a your mileage may vary thing, and the other one is a genuine issue that I have with it. Um, let's go with the your mileage may vary thing first. Uh, this movie has basically no emotional hook. Um, yeah. It doesn't play with an audience on an emotional level. You're not supposed to feel anything for these characters, really. Yeah, You're not yeah. supposed to relate to the characters. You're not really supposed to like understand the characters' motivations and like yeah. feel for them or feel anything about them. Um, besides, just having this uncomfortable experience with them, right? It doesn't. Yeah. You're not supposed to relate to the characters. It's trying to put you in the mindset of these characters, and I understand that for some people. Having a movie that's just full of terrible people acting in completely fucked up, bizarre ways can be exhausting. Yeah. If you don't have like a solid emotional hook to your characters, that can actually be a problem for some audiences. Now, this film yeah. isn't made for those kinds of people, mm -hmm. right? This film isn't designed for those kinds of people. It's supposed to engage you purely on an experiential and intellectual level, which I have a lot of fun with. I really enjoy picking apart what different bits of movies mean and mm -hmm. also, like, you know, I like movies that basically trade on discomfort, the trade on negative yeah. experiences. Yeah. I like movies like that. Um, but this isn't a film where you can identify with the protagonist and hope that they turn out okay. Like mm -hmm. a slasher movie might be. Or like a more conventional, like, you know, when you see James Caan in Misery, for example, because we talked about Misery recently, or when yeah. you see... Um, I, I forget what the name of the name of the actress who plays the protagonist in uh, Descent is. You want them to get out. You want yeah. them to get out, which provides an emotional investment. This film doesn't have that as an, as 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 a as a hook, so it, it might not hook some people for that reason. It did mm -hmm. hook me, but it's not going to appeal to a very wide audience. My issue with the film is that it dips its toes into a lot of thematic stuff, and then entrenches itself in a few things. But yeah. I think it can leave with a sense of some things feeling unexplored, like yeah. the homoerotic connection between Pattinson and Defoe, for example. It's brought up once or twice, but not really um, explored properly. Um, and I think what that comes down to is the film is actually like really badly marketed. Um, yeah, it marketed itself as a horror movie, um, as a you know, as a very Lovecraftian horror film, but it comes out as this psychedelic psycho drama. Yeah, that's um, what I see. Yeah. Which, exactly as Russell said, which isn't a fault of the movie, but I hate it when studios push a movie as something that it isn't. Um, sometimes, it when, it's, when it's very deliberate, it can be done yeah. like, well, like Drive or Spring Breakers, right? That's a great example. Yeah. Both of those movies I like less than this film, but they were advertised better because it made a conscious decision to make a switch. Um, but that's about oh. it. Um, I don't think it was super well marketed. I don't think I think it's a bit thematically broad, and if you want to watch a movie with characters that you relate to and identify with and want to see survive or have a happy ending, you're not going to get them. Yeah, I well, it it, oh, it comes at night was one of those films for me that yeah, was advertised sure. wrong. Um, it seems like I, I, A24 I, has I, a problem I, with I, that. I hated that film. I, I did not like that film at all because I think the way it was marketed was marketed like this. It was going to be this big type of horror film. And it mm -hmm. wasn't. It was not that type of film. Um, and I just, I remember being let down and hating it. And I have, you know, I just blame the way that they marketed it. Uh, I've seen it, I've seen it comes at night like three times. And I've liked it less every time I've seen it. It was just one of those things. I walked out, I was like, fuck, this movie sucks. I was so excited because of the fact that they marketed mm -hmm. like this horror movie. And I'm like, I'm on board. Obviously the brand A24 I love. And I'm like, this was going to be a really good film. I go see it. I'm like, this movie sucks. And, like, I was so disappointed because I'm, like, I, I was sold this, but I was given that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, like, I liked it in the cinemas because I, 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 I try to go into films without any big expectations. Yeah, um, I try to Which do is an incredibly movie. difficult thing to do, right? So I liked it in the cinemas because I thought For it was sure. an interesting cinema experience. I've seen it two times since. Second time I thought it was okay. And then the third time I was like, oh, I actually don't want to watch this movie ever again, really. Yeah, it's, it was bad. 
I respect it a lot more than I like it. Very, very well made movie that I now do not care for at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the thing. I think A twenty four has that problem of mismarketing a lot because. Uh, only really said, their horror movies. Their dramas yeah. and their comedies are marketed really well. I think it's, it's actually really difficult to market horror. Um, like, it's it's super hard to market horror in a way it that's is. not, like, focusing on, you know, like, films like... Midsommar was, was um, mismarketed, too. I, I thought that Midsommar was incredibly well marketed. <laughs> that really? first trailer for Midsommar, I think, is one of the best trailers ever made. Um, fully. Wow. I think it's one of the greatest trailers of all time. Um, well, I'm almost on Beautiful. What's all right. Um, so oh, we, ta- we talked about the pros. We- oh, your phone. I don't know. We'll, we'll come back in. Yeah. No, you're, you're good. In. I'm sorry. It's probably the last place you left it. Ha 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 ha. She can't find her phone. No, you're Have right. you looked where you lost put it down? <laughs> so have you looked in the place where you lost put it down? I put it down. All right. Yeah, I'm breaking Wait, up. Of course, of course. Can you hear three? me? No, 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 you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Three. I'm at, I'm in the same place I was. I fucking hate this. Wait, story. no, dude, you're fine. Are we breaking up? Are we breaking up on you? No, you're fine. Then you're fine. No, you're you're fine. fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I thought I thought it was me. Okay. No, 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 no. We, we, took it, we were talking to your wife. It's chill. Okay, we're good. <laughs> All right, so three, two, one. All right, guys. We talked about the pros, the cons, favorite moments. Uh, so now it's time for ratings. As you guys know, we do have different ratings depending on the movies. I couldn't think of one for a rating, so I just went. Five uh, dead birds. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I went lighthouses, but no, no, no. five dead seabirds. How about dead fart- How about farts? Five farts. Five <laughs> <laughs> farts. There you have it. Done. <laughs> All right, five farts. Let's go, Luca. Let's start with you. Oh, this is a five fart movie every day. Of the week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this movie is beautiful. Um, oh my God. I think that, again, I go back and forth whether I prefer this or The Witch. I think that I, ultimately, I respect this film a lot more than I respect The Witch. I might have a more fun time watching The Witch. Um, but this movie is so daring and so audacious mm-hmm. and so <laughs> unconcerned with, you know, the Hollywood expectations and even the indie movie expectations this is a real fucking art house movie and it's experimental. It's got two incredibly good performances. The cinematography is incredible. One thing that we haven't talked about at all, actually, is Mark Corbin's score. Mark Corbin is- Oh, the score is incredible. Right and he deserves way more work. He did the score for this. He did the score for The Witch. Um, he the did Witch the too? For, yeah, yeah, yeah. For Cube and for um, uh, that movie, Our House. Um, and he's an unbelievable composer and deserves way more work and way more recognition. Um, Mm -hmm. This film is beautiful. It's an incredible experience. If you're happy to sit down for an hour and 40 minutes and just be uncomfortable and weirded out, and it feels transcendent, right? Like, I've seen this film. This film came out last year. I've seen it, like, five times. Um, And I saw it... And I saw it three times in the theaters. Um, See, I wanted to watch it in the theaters. I saw it. I saw. I saw it three times in the theaters, and it never, it never played time, up here. It was it like something just left me. Like I was exercised by this movie. It is an unbelievably transcendent experience, verging on spiritual. It is incredible. Five out of five, any day of the week. Five big old farts. <laughs> Russ, on to you. Dude, I'm, you know me in the halfers, man. I'm gonna give this a four and a half. It's like almost like a shark, like a four and a half, and like a little squeak, like one of those little squeaks. You know what I mean? Sure, 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 um, sure, sure. But to me, it's four, like four, 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 kind of, <laughs> like, four and a little small little squeak. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a film that you can watch, and you're like, I don't know. It's like the character development through this film really takes you into a, a head of like mad. Somebody who's completely mad. Like, again, I'll mm-hmm. say The Shining again because of the fact that I think that's a really good character study of somebody who's going off the deep end. Oh, and yeah. this, film's the, this film kind of follows suit. Um, it, it, it is daring. It is one of those types of films where they're like, you know what? You can tell there was no, like, walls for this film. No. Like, there was no, like, boundaries or whatever. Like, anything was on the table, and it shows. Um, it was not one of those things that you thought that when you're watching it and you're done with it, you're like, damn, like I wasn't expecting this from the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? 
But overall, like I said, it's a fun time. Um, great acting performances, I think, really drive this film. I love the, you know, the cinematography we talked about. It's gorgeous. Um, it really, it's, it really puts you in that period. It really puts you in that early, you know, late 1890s, early 1900s feel to it. It feels like you literally came upon this, like, upon this film or whatever and just put it on. This is like what really, you know what I mean? Almost like a Blair Witch type thing where it's like, this is what, this is what, uh, you know, unfolded or, you know, before your eyes. And it's, yeah, it's just one of those films that it stays with you. It's easily quotable. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of how Luca said, man, you can make memes for days for this film. So like memes I said, it's a fun film. Days. It's a fun film. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Russ on the rating. Four and a half farts. Uh, can't, can't believe we're using this, but yeah, let's go with it. Um, I think the cinematography is fantastic. The score is incredible. It's beautiful. Uh, great dialogue. Great back and forth with the characters. Um, but there are some parts to me where I can't give it a five. Like I did get confused halfway through the movie. Wasn't sure what's going on. And I think you could cut about 10 minutes from this movie and ha have it be at a perfect 90 minute movie. Um, but again, four and a half, uh, farts out of five. Um, <clears throat> oh my God. Um, so now it's time for. The horror corner. Da da da. It's my pick this week for uh, May twenty fourth month, and I went with something that I've never seen before, so this should be fun. I'm going the killing of a sacred deer from twenty seventeen. I look forward to the arguments over whether it's not as a horror movie. I'm going to tell you it, straight out of the gate, it's not. But that's just me. It is what it is. I've seen it twice. We'll, we'll I mean, see. I'm that Jack actually thinks Requiem for a Dream is a horror movie, so, you know. <laughs> the it, it is depressing as fuck. <laughs> but, that uh, it is. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about it, man. It'll be yeah, fun. definitely. I went with this one because one is one I haven't seen. And looking up A24 horror movies, this one popped up, so. It's on Netflix. I know that. And uh, Is it really? Viewer, okay. Tell the viewers, Lighthouse, if you have Amazon Prime, uh, Lighthouse Amazon. is actually on Amazon Prime. So is uh, Hereditary and Midsommar. If you're and watching so in the UK, you're going to have to pay for The Lighthouse. Um, the Witch used to be on Netflix, but it isn't anymore. Uh, but The Mids Midsommar is free in the UK. If you want to watch that. There you have yeah. it. Which you should, because that movie's unbelievable. <laughs> yep. Uh, and guys, remember, May 24th month is not over yet, because we have mine next week. Then we have Russ is the week after, which I'm not sure he has come up with one yet. But I'm I'm still teetering. I, I it's probably going to be Midsummer, but I'm I'm teetering. I, I I'll I'm a game time decision. I'm I'm thinking. I just I, yeah. I only want to watch something I haven't seen yet to kind of like test the the waters. But mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. All right, and you know what? I feel comfortable to uh, announce this now for next month's uh, interesting um, oh, topic. Yeah. We are doing shitty horror movie month. Just incredibly garbage movies. We're just going to be doing, like, the worst shit we can find. Uh, <laughs> whether it's funny, whether it makes us mad. Just, like, if you want to fucking bring just a garbage-ass terrible movie to the table, because I think we've been talking about too many good movies, and one of yeah. the things I love about horror movies so much is that they horror movies are the best bad movies. Yes, they far. are. We in the genre have, I think... Some of the best good movies, but all of the best shitty movies are ours. Je Jennifer's Body, hello. <laughs> uh, wait, wait, what? No, Jennifer's, body. Jennifer's Body is good though. It, it, it's a shitty, it's a shitty horror film though. For I sure. really like it though. I think it's more like Troll like, Two, uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, Atropophagus, fucking hell. Like all of those cheap eighties video nasty exploitation films. Jesus, dude. Oh, I, I have. Know. I know exactly what I'm thinking. Dude, I have Shudder, so I have like nothing but B level horror movies. No, I know I know exactly what I'm gonna pick. It is terrible and it is so offensive. Oh can't. god. Oh, I can't. It is no one of the most movies I've it, ever seen in my Russ, life. I, Russ, oh my I'm I'm not surprised though, it's Luca. If it's not offensive, I I wouldn't believe it. No, I mean I'm an, I'm uh, I'm a big old gay social justice warrior. I mean Lucas not picked a family friendly film, so it's all good, man. No. I, I, I wouldn't expect anything family else. Friendly movies, really. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else. So I mean it, it is it's a it's it's a compliment. All right, guys. So shitty uh horror movies are next month, which is what is that what is us about talking about shit and farts this episode? 
This is not an this is not an Adam Sandler movie. Okay, that's a perfect tie-in though. Good segue. Thank you, Uh, Russ. Where can people find you for our closing plugs? Yeah, Notorious by Chance uh, podcast I do with my good buddy uh, Chance Ellison. We are going to be we just reviewed Contagion for virus films, obviously. (laughs) It's actually really good in light of COVID nineteen, and obviously how eerily like crazy like parallels to now. Um, we will be reviewing. We didn't put a pull up this week. We're going to be doing the adventures of Pluto Nash. Uh, oh, it was, it was, it was, it was oh, something God. that neither one of us have seen. Chance, oh, wanted, to do this. Chance no. wanted to do this forever ago. So I'm I, looking forward to talking so about the, the film that literally lost the most money. You guys have reviewed movie, 40, movie 43, right? Yeah, we already did movie 43. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. This should be fun. Um, but yeah, we're going to review that. And then I think we have, uh, I think we're going to be doing 15 year anniversary. So movies that came out in 2005, which would be really good. But uh, yeah, you can find us there. Find us notorious by chance on YouTube, where we still got to put new content up. We haven't done that yet. We will. And that's really about it. You can find me in fan leagues, pretty much competing in trivia and all that stuff. Cause we're nerds and that's what we do. Hell yeah. Luca. You can find me on nerd entertainment network. I guess I'm the channel mascot right now. Yep. Um, <laughs> you can find me on horror Street. You can share Lyric Breakdown. We're talking about Machine Gun Kelly. Uh, maybe. Uh, if maybe. It comes out. <laughs> uh, we're also going to be talking about some M&M stuff and maybe some Tom McDonald stuff. I'm going to fucking rage about Tom McDonald for like 50 minutes. Uh, <laughs> you can also find me on here on the horoscope and uh, on Movie Trillia Challenge. I have a match coming out against Caleb Goho the King. That's going to be super fun and super good. Is it already out? Uh, no, it comes out this week. Uh, uh, this this week. Friday. That's going to be super fun. Uh, I'm going to kick he ass. Um, All right, guys. That, always, leave me alone. I don't have much of a social media presence. I don't like being watched. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you have it. <laughs> so enjoy I'm your time. To as quarantine as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy Six your time, feet, motherfucker. Six feet, Eight. motherfuckers. Um, Ryan, <laughs> so enjoy your time with Luca because you're not getting a lot of it, as you said, Luke. <laughs> um. Of course, you have the Horoscope Podcast right here. Lyric Breakdown is a show that uh, we're testing out right now. Um, behind the scenes knowledge here, uh, audio fucked up, so the MGK one might not come out, but we will do another one in replace of it. Sounds familiar, huh, Russ? Oh man, it's the story <laughs> of our life. It I know, is right? What it is, man. Um, but it is what it is. If you guys enjoyed that, hit that like button, subscribe to Nerd Entertainment Network. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys soon. Peace. Peace.